shall be Well, good evening, church. It is good to see you in God's house. Praise the Lord. Trust you've had a, a week in the presence of the Lord so far, or a few days here into the week. And uh, looking forward to just uh, meeting with the Lord tonight. I was reading that psalm. It's a, a very familiar one in Psalm 121. It says, I will lift mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And goes on to clarify, my help cometh from the Lord. How many can say amen to that? My help cometh from the Lord. And uh, I was just thinking, somebody uh, wrote this phrase and it stuck with me. God will empty heaven of angels before he will leave one of his children defenseless. And that means, you know, uh, Satan may be strong to come against us, but how many know we know the victor. Praise God. How many know we're more than conquerors? Praise the Lord. So let's stand. We're here to celebrate that tonight. Amen. We're thankful for what God has been doing in our lives and in our church, and we just want to worship Him. So why don't we take a moment, just raise a hand and raise our voice, and let's just welcome His presence. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather middle of the week, Lord, and just uh, take time and worship in your word and our prayer. Lord, I pray that you would just minister and uh, remind us of how great you are with your power and your presence here tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Join them as they worship and lead us in uh, singing tonight. Let's just worship the Lord. on 
on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Oh, I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Like that line in the last verse there is resting in my Savior as my all in all. I'm so thankful he is our all in all. Let's worship him. This is an old hymn we haven't sang in a while, but it just has a great message. Just praising the Lord for who he is. So let's worship him as we sing. When I saw the cleansing
tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let
bless you. You can be seated. I was thinking about that first hymn we sang, Standing on the Promises. When you look in Scripture, anybody remember what the rainbow represents? Promise, covenant. Of course, there's a demographic of our culture that has hijacked the rainbow and but you know I, I was thinking of uh, the three men in scripture who saw a rainbow Noah he saw the rainbow after the storm then you've got Ezekiel he saw a rainbow during the storm John, book of Revelation, saw a rainbow before the storm. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? So no matter before, during, or after your storm, the message is still the same. God always keeps his promises. Amen. And God's goodness is not based on our present circumstances. He's, he's God because there's none other. And he's good because he's God. Amen. So we rejoice in that. He answers prayer. That's why we take our needs to him and believe him. Praise the Lord. So, well, this, this is Wednesday before camp. So next Wednesday night's going to be out at the campgrounds. So uh, why don't we take tonight and just make that a matter of prayer as well. Pray for uh, next week. Uh, looks like we're in for some pretty good weather. We got to pray that that just keeps, keeps uh, coming our direction and we don't have any disruptions in the weather pattern. Looking forward to God meeting us there. And uh, so let's uh, keep believing. I, uh, I know I... Uh, I was speaking with Brother Reuben earlier, and I know he shared with me that uh, Sister uh, Tara, his wife, uh, Tara's brother and sister-in-law and family uh, are recovering from that stuff that's been going around, and uh, her sister-in-law is hopefully going to get out of the hospital. She's been hospitalized, but hoping to get out in the next couple of days, I believe. So uh, they requested prayer, so let's, let's pray for them that God would minister to them, amen, during this time and uh, grant some uh, healing in their bodies. Uh, we've got uh, church family, individuals that uh, are just uh, uh, not able to be with us tonight. I know uh, some of them are just uh, uh, still uh, not strong enough, and so let's pray for them and remember them. Let's remember uh, our community. Let's pray for the unchurched in our families, uh, that God would minister to them. And uh, aren't you glad for the gospel and what it means and the power of the gospel to reach the lost? And uh, so I pray that you uh, continue to keep your lost loved ones before the Lord. We're praying for our nation. We need to pray and trust God to minister there. We need to pray for uh, the peace of Jerusalem, as Scripture uh, tells us to. Uh, those are just some things that obviously I think should be uh, on our prayer list continuously. And so let's keep believing, keep praying. And like I said, let's pray and pray for next week of camp. Who else? Maybe you've got a need on your heart. We'll start over here. Anybody want to share a need? We'll, we'll bear it with you to the Lord. Anybody? Sister Rush? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. If I heard that right, it was uh, Sherry and Lloyd's son? Okay, all right, Luke, all right. Let's believe the Lord for some healing there. Anybody else on this side? How about here in the middle? Prayer request, you want to share with us? 
We'll agree with you in prayer. How about over here? Sister Cooper? Absolutely. Brother Cooper. Absolutely. Let's remember Brother Cooper's brother, Ron. Sister Treadway? Yes, yes. All right. Recovering from surgery. Sister Denise? several needs there from salvation to strength and healing <clears throat> amen anybody else unspoken requests uplifted hand let's all stand together amen how many know god can do anything anything nothing is too hard for our god let's agree together in prayer right where you're at father thank you for the power of your spirit Thank you, Lord, for the promises. We've sung about them. We've talked about them. And, Lord, we believe that one of the promises in your word is that if we ask, if we seek, Lord, when we pray, when we bend our knee to our King, our heavenly King, Lord, you hear, you incline your ear unto your people. Hallelujah. And we, your children, have gathered here tonight, Lord, we're bringing requests. We're bringing circumstances. We're bringing our burdens to the Lord. And we're going to leave them in your hands, Father, from physical to spiritual, Lord. Oh, to emotional. God, we're believing by the hand of God to go the distance. Meet individuals, Lord, that are in the hospital, Lord. It at home right tonight, not able to join us, Lord. We're trusting you, those right in our midst, Lord. Let them fill a special measure of the holy anointing of the Holy Ghost to minister and touch their needs. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you're still saving. Oh, hallelujah. You're still transforming lives. In Jesus' name, now every request, every unspoken request, Lord, you know every heart, every situation. Come and meet us in these moments of prayer and petition. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Believe him, church. Let's trust him together tonight. Oh, place that need under the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for the answer, Lord. Recovery and strength and healing and deliverance, salvation. Oh, we give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Give him a hand clap of praise. Isn't he worthy? So, so worthy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. All right. God bless you. Be seated in his presence. Praise God. Praise God. Remember... Uh, the pop pyramid, you still can bring pop this Sunday, and you can even bring it probably next week when you come to the uh, tabernacle. Just make sure it gets over there to Snack Shack uh, where uh, Brother and Sister Pritchett are, and uh, so uh, we'll put it to good use. Uh, we also, Sister Sandy mentioned today, uh, things have turned around a little bit. Now we need one teen uh, guy counselor. All right, so uh, we're still in need of a counselor for the guys now, 
Uh, we also need a few more night patrols or guards uh, that just kind of patrol the grounds at, uh, during the uh, night. And uh, so if you can uh, sign up, I believe those sign up cards are back there um, in the uh, communication station area back there. All right. Uh, also, we need more desserts, I believe, uh, for Sister uh, Miranda and Josh in the kitchen. So uh, if you can help them out, uh, be sure. And uh, do you want them to let you know, let Sandy know? What's the best way to do that, Sister Miranda? Let you know or Sandy know? Okay. All right. So uh, just uh, be mindful. We could sure use some more desserts keep those kids' energy levels up, right? Uh, yes, praise the Lord. So, all right, ushers, go ahead and come, give you an opportunity to give. We so appreciate your generosity, your faithfulness. It means so much. Amen. So we appreciate that. Remember this, uh, let's go tomorrow evening. We've got ladies' prayer group meets at 6.30 in the prayer room. Gentlemen, we meet at 8.30, uh, excuse me, 8 o'clock. Saturday uh, mornings, and then uh, a few of us going to be meeting back out at the campground, setting the tabernacle up, the chairs and the carpet and everything, putting the finishing touches on it. So uh, if you uh, if you want to come out and help us, that would be just fine. All right, praise the Lord. Other than that, let's give to the Lord tonight. May the Lord richly bless you for it. Father, thank you once again for who you are. God, your faithfulness to your people and to this ministry through the years, many decades, Lord, we've seen your goodness. Now meet us as we give to your work, and we'll give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 God bless you as you give. Praise the Lord. I do want to say I appreciate all the hard work and the participation that's already uh, went in to the campgrounds. It means a whole lot. It really does, and we don't want to don't want to take that for granted. Praise the Lord. Well, good to have the Ralstons in town. Praise the Lord, Brother Ralston. You want to come and preach tonight? No. <laughs> Glory to God. Always a pleasure to have them back home. Uh, praise the Lord. And so uh, are you going to be able to stay through camp? Wonderful. We've got reinforcements from Georgia. That's awesome. All right. Good deal. All right. Uh, we have been in a series uh, called uh, Summer in the Psalms. And we are... Uh, continuing that series tonight, and uh, so we're going to be going to the third psalm, Psalm 3, Psalm number 3. We're going to read the entire psalm, it's just eight verses, and so uh, we're going to share in that psalm together, and then we're going to take a look and just see some ways that it can apply to our lives, amen. Is that okay? Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Trust you was able to pick up a study guide. Amen. We just like to be able to put something in your hands, take a few notes. And maybe it'll stick a little better. Brother Beam at Export used to tell us in his class, because uh, he, uh, he could lecture and you would just find yourself writing and writing and writing. And he would say, well, he said, there's a link between the pen and the brain. And so he said, write it down. So, uh, all right. So if that, that be the case, then uh, you have a few blanks to fill in. And so we're going to just 
uh, navigate down through your study guide and see what the Lord has in store. So why don't we stand before you get too comfortable, Psalm chapter 3. Why don't we read this psalm in concert? I think maybe we can do that in unison. Amen. Just eight verses <clears throat> uh, and uh, share it together. Psalm 3, verse 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me. Out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awakened, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessings is upon thy people. Selah. Father, thank you, Lord, for this series. Thank you for the many psalms we have already taken a look at. Tonight we come to Psalm 3. I pray once again that you will open our eyes to see your truth Open our ears to hear your truth and our minds to understand your truth. Well, thank you for these things in Christ's name. Everybody shout a amen. All right. God bless you. You can be seated. Well, I've just uh, titled this one, Looking to the Lifter. Uh, I want to begin by spending a moment or two creating a little... Uh, historic framework uh, which may prove helpful as we study the context and the content of this uh, psalm this evening. Now historians are quite certain that this is a psalm of David. Okay, we've studied several psalms and we've seen different authors. Uh, tonight uh, we are pretty certain this one came from the pen of David. For example, the heading uh, for this psalm in my Bible says this, and I quote, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. So here is where we should begin. I think we should begin right there at that heading, okay, because we're reminded that Absalom was David's third son, okay? Uh, David's second son was named Chiliab, and he's never mentioned again after the reference to his birth. And so the assumption is that he died early on, perhaps as a child. Now, David's firstborn son was Amnon, and the story of how Amnon died is a pretty wretched one. Amnon had raped his half-sister Tamar. And so Absalom, Tamar's brother, remember when he swore revenge. It took two years, but finally Absalom arranged for Amnon to be killed. Fearing punishment from his dad, King David, Absalom goes into exile, and he hides for about three years. When he finally returned to Jerusalem, Daddy David refused to see him. Two more years passed, chronologically it seems in the uh, text, before David and his son Absalom were reunited, although even then they were not truly reconciled. Okay? Absalom's plot to steal the throne from his father uh, David most likely 
emerged gradually. He began, Scripture tells us in 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 6, he began by winning the favor with the people of Israel. He portrayed himself as one who was interested in their lives. He would tell them he was more capable of helping them with their troubles and securing justice for their complaints than was his father David, the king. According to 2 Samuel 15, 6, and I quote, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So, once he felt secure in his position, he makes his move. You've read it. He goes to Hebron, assembled some followers, and had himself anointed king. Now, with a considerable army behind him, Absalom marches against his own father into Jerusalem, forces his own father to flee the palace, now, following a shameful period of hiding and absence from the throne, finally the armies of David eventually prevails over Absalom. Absalom was killed contrary to his father's express wishes, serving only to intensify the family pain. So, that's the scene for this psalm. Okay? David driven from his throne, subjected to indescribable humiliation, not by a pagan king, but by his own flesh and blood. Somebody say, that had to hurt. Right? Absalom's treachery, his rebellion, literally crushed David's heart. And here is the important point, though. It is while David was fleeing the armies of his son Absalom, broken by the spiteful betrayal of his own child, that he sat down and wrote the words of this psalm. It wasn't while David was on the golden throne with his servants tending to every beck and call. It wasn't while he was... Uh, laying his head on a soft pillow in the palace with all of his family doing well. Rather, it was in the midst of probably the most dark, devastating, desperate hour. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That David penned these words. David's anguish was so magnified by the fact that his adversaries were primarily from among his own family. Some of his royal staff and servants, those that were once the closest to him, those to whom he had once placed his confidence, placed his trust in, are now among those who are throwing out accusations, the most bitter and hateful ones. Uh, like verse 2 says, David says, many there be, which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Now, how many know one of the primary tactics of such enemies is to undermine our faith in God to help us? Because David may well have been taunted with statements like, oh, if God is so good and he is so great, how come we've got the upper hand now, David? How about... Uh, how come you're on the run, David? Where is your God now when you need him the most? Hmm? Perhaps they began to throw David's past uh, up to him, his sin with uh, that uh, relationship with Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah, his failure as a father to Amnon and Absalom, etc., David, God's not going to put up with that sort of thing. He's abandoning you for sure. Right? The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said this, and I quote, If all the trials which come from heaven, all the temptations which ascend from hell, 
and all the crosses which arise from earth could all be mixed together, pressed together, they would not make a trial so terrible as that which is contained in this verse, verse 2. It is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. That's a pretty terrible thought, isn't it? No help from God. Right? So yet in the midst of David's affliction, in the midst of accusation, in the midst of abandonment, David cries out to the Lord, calls him this, this which Lord there is the covenant-keeping God, as he mentions in verse 1. Now, David obviously knew that the paralyzing power of the enemy is broken only by turning your eyes back to God, right? And so here's what I want us to do tonight. I want us to take down uh, just simply three things that David is going to encourage himself with tonight as he recalls them about his God. Number one, this is what he recalls. Number one, God is a shield about him. Say that with me. God is a shield about him. Absalom had created an entire army against his father. Overwhelmed, David cries out to the Lord as he calculates how many are against him. He says thousands. Now, how many, how many has ever felt that way? You felt like people are just against you. Now, uh, it, it, it doesn't take a few, but it seems like thousands when you know a few's against you. Hello. Anybody in here ever known the, the sharp pain of betrayal? You don't have to raise your hand. Rather than focusing on his enemies, David, oh, aren't you glad he focuses on the Lord? Huh? And David reminds the Lord that he is a shield to him. Now, this seems to be an appropriate yet interesting way to pray. It shows that David was a man of war. He was well acquainted with the battlefield. He, he describes the Lord's protection as a shield. Now, shields were very large in ancient warfare. They were made of solid wood, typically weighed approximately 40 pounds. Okay, They were the size of doors. Strapped in leather, some shields were so large that when arrows began to fly, two or three men could hide behind or beneath them. Okay? What an incredible metaphor for God's protection. I think it's pretty good. I think David nailed it. Right? And truth is, we face a far stronger enemy than even Absalom. See, our enemy is far greater, far more dangerous. Paul, if you look in Ephesians chapter 6, reminds us of how fierce our enemy is. He's got flaming darts, right? Okay, so Paul reminds us, but he is vicious, he is strong, but the Lord promises he's our shield of defense, right? And so we may be surrounded, Broadway, by a godless culture, we may find ourselves in this present darkness. We may be bombarded by temptations, tested by trials, pressed by an enemy whose sole objective is to steal and kill and destroy. But the one redeeming truth is the Lord is a shield around us. Oh, somebody ought to say, thank God, he's my shield. He protects us from every side, above, around, beneath. He's a multi-directional shield. Hello. Amen. How many has ever felt that shield around you? Praise God. But the fact that God is a shield, notice on your worksheet, does not prevent one's enemies from continually shooting their arrows. Yet, such an attack is fruitless, though, in cutting us off from the security of God's power and His presence. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. 
A.W. Tozer said this, and I quote, For each of us, the time is coming when we shall have nothing but God. Health and wealth and friends and hiding places will be swept away, and we shall have only God. And to the man of pseudo-faith, that is a terrifying thought. But to the real faith, it is one of the most comforting thoughts that the heart can entertain. See, when God is our shield, it means that he totally surrounds us and that nothing can touch our life unless he lets it through. Oh, you better, you better store that in your memory. You may need it in the future. Huh? Where did this come from? Evidently, God let it through. That means that there is a God-ordained purpose for everything that happens to us. Number two, God is his glory. David has been driven from his palace in shame. He's been driven in humiliation and weakness. His pride has been broken. His reputation has been slandered. Kings were used to being surrounded by glory, right? But now David has been stripped of his, what? Glory. Huh? Is this making sense? He is now separated from any of his royal glory. No glorious throne to recline on. No glorious palace to serve as his refuge. No glorious servants to tend to his every wish and desire. Hey, he's roughing it in the wilderness. Hello. David is saying presently, I have no glory of my own. But he realizes, I don't need any glory of my own. As long as the Lord is with me, his glory is more than I need. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I put no trust in my own fame or fortune, David realized, because God alone is my joy and he is the glory of my life. Listen, is God your glory tonight? The word glory in, is a, a translation of a Hebrew word that actually means weight or significance. When David said that God was his glory, he was saying that God was the weightiest, most significant thing in his life. He was saying that you could put everything else on one side of the scale and put God on the other and God would outweigh it all. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God was David's glory, and there's nothing more important than him. Some people today, you know them, I know them, they measure their worth by beauty, their intelligence and money and power and prestige, but David found his security and his worth in the glory of God. Listen, he, he said that many people stood against him. He heard their cruel voices. He no doubt was tempted to begin to believe them and to give way to discouragement, to give way to depression. Nevertheless, he strengthened his heart with the words, You, O Lord, are my glory. What a change that realization made. He had God and his enemies did not. Did you hear that? He had God, but his enemies did not. And verses like this can bring, bring peace to our heart, even in the midst of a storm, because God will deal with our adversaries in due time. Meanwhile, we let him be our glory. All right? We don't have to defend ourselves. Rather, like David, we lay down and sleep. He said, I lay me down and slept in peace. Uh, though tens of thousands were against me. Why? Because the Lord was my sustainer. He's my glory. God is to be our glory. He is to be our highest priority. And the one person we find our ultimate pride and joy in. Notice that on your worksheet. I may have blew through that kind of quick, so I want to direct you back to that. One of the many stories I was reading uh, from the Civil War happened in a battle when a New York regiment was coming under heavy artillery fire from the Confederate line. It says the colonel of an adjoining regiment uh, came over to tell the leader of the New York unit 
that they were coming under such heavy fire because their American flag, we call it old glory, huh? He said, your, your, your flag is posted in such a prominent way, it's making you an obvious target. And so he suggested that they lower their flag a bit to avoid such heavy artillery fire. Well, the Union commander, upon hearing the uh, colonel's suggestion, he looked up at the flag and he saw it waving in the wind. And he turns back to the colonel and he says, let it wave. Why? Because it's our glory. That's what he said. Let it wave. It's our glory. Because to him, old glory was worth any amount of artillery fire. It was worth any, even the hazard of death. Uh, folks, I was thinking when we engage in worship, some folks would say, Broadway, you can quiet down. You don't need to be that loud and emotional. You can lower your volume. God's not deaf. But you know what I say? Let the praise roar. Let the hands wave high. Why? Because he's our glory. I said he's our glory. And we're just worshiping him and reminding ourselves he's our glory. Oh, somebody raise your hands and say, you're my glory. Got any patriots here tonight? I know we do. Huh? I are one. But listen, if you are a Christian, there is an allegiance that is greater than that owed to our nation. Hmm? It's the allegiance that is due to our God. Huh? And for the genuine believer, there is no earthly kingdom which takes precedence over the kingdom of heaven. And there is no greater glory for us than the glory of God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, Lord, you're my glory. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Number three. He also says, God is the one who lifts up his head. Now, when we back up, David leaves Jerusalem, not only defeated, but depressed. He hung his head in shame. We'll see that in a moment from 2 Samuel 15. But right here, he's confident that God is going to elevate his head and restore his hope as he looks to him. Many of you here can recall January the 8th, 2011, when U.S. Representative Gabby Gifford was shot during a meeting called Congress in Your Corner which was held in a Safeway parking lot in Tuscan, uh, Tucson, Arizona, metropolitan area there. Um, Jared Lee Lofner drew a pistol, shot, I believe, 18 people. Six of them died, including a federal district court chief judge, one of uh, Gifford's staffers, and a nine-year-old girl named Christina Taylor Green. Now, nine-year-old Christina Taylor Green was former Philadelphia Phillies baseball manager Dallas Green's granddaughter. Did you get that? Shortly after that tragedy, in a media interview, Dallas Green was asked how he was going to cope with their family's tragic loss. And he said, and I quote, he said, I hope we can all get through it. And he said, and we'll get through it with the help of baseball. Now his response that baseball was going to get them through that tragedy when I heard that, I thought, that's interesting. Not downplaying in no means their tragedy. Truly tragic. But I, as a believer, 
expected, you, you, when something that happens like that, you just expect to say, we're going to get through this with the help of God. Right? But he said, baseball. And I thought, is this not the case in our culture now? Where people are looking to so many other things to lift them from their problems instead of God. They hope that sports will be the lifter of their head. Huh? Others hope that education is going to be the solution to the national problems and basically be the lifter of our heads. They think science and medicine is going to be the cure all for the ills of our nation and be the thing that lifts up our heads. Listen, and let me emphasize, there's nothing wrong with medicine. There's nothing wrong with education by no means. There's nothing wrong with playing some sports. But none of those things can take the place of God who is truly our ultimate salvation and deliverer and the lifter up of our heads. Many times we only look to human solutions to lift our heads. We look to what our five senses can see. We look to our ledgers, to our bank accounts. But David chose not to look at what his five senses could see coming over the horizon. He looked to the Lord. He looked for the miraculous. And see, when we are faced with adversity, where are we going to look? Hopefully, it will be to the one who we can truly lift our heads. Oh, hallelujah. Let me share with you, there's a word picture involved here in the phrase, the lifter of my head. Because, you know, our head is naturally bowed down in time of trouble. Isn't that the truth? Our head naturally bows down in time of trouble. So for God to be the lifter of your head means that he is going to bring you out of that time of trouble so that we are no longer bowing our head in misery or pain because he has lifted our head, right? Uh, uh, 2 Samuel 15 says that David was being driven from Jerusalem. Okay? He, he's been dr uh, driven by his own son's attempted overthrow. And he leaves Jerusalem. And he, he, the Bible says he comes out of the gate of Jerusalem and he walks through the valley and up the Mount of Olives. And, and as he walks, he covers his head and wept. Huh? He bows his head in, in weeping and in grief. See, that is our natural stance when we are in dire straits. Our heads are lowered and bowed. But when we get good news, our heads are lifted up and we begin to rejoice again. Okay? What was originally a word picture from our body language became in Hebrew kind of a technical term for delivering someone from a time of trouble. For example, you take 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 27. It says that the king of Babylon lifted up the head of Jeho Jehoiakim out of prison. So, all right, delivered him out of prison. Genesis 40, 13, Joseph foresaw that Je uh, Pharaoh would, quote, lift up the head of the cupbearer out of prison and restore him to his former position. So to lift one's head means that one's position and fortunes were going to be restored. Okay, it means that uh, their heads, which were once bowed in sorrow, is going to be lifted in joy again. David says, God, you're going to do that for me. I know that. And David did not say, I'm going to uh, look for a few loyal folks that I have left in my kingdom and they'll get my position back and we'll take the palace back. No, he didn't say my royal staff is going to lift up my head. He didn't say I'm going to a friend or an ally like King Hiram of Tyre and he'll help restore my, my uh, throne and lift up my head. No, David said the Lord himself is the lifter of my head. He said, God will be the one who will turn my mourning into dancing, turn my sorrow into joy. Oh, hallelujah. He said, God will be the one that delivers me. I don't need anybody else. Broadway, God is reminding some of us here tonight that we don't need to be looking to anybody else other than him for our deliverance. Some of you are looking all around and you're, 
you're thinking, this one can help in this situation, or that one can help me out of this specific, specific situation. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that God's not going to use a person or two to help, because he can do that, right? Because God does use people. But I do want to say, don't look to people for your ultimate help. Look to God. Maybe you're in a particular situation and you have thought, so-and-so is going to help me. They're going to get me out of this. And you feel, really, you feel really good and confident about it. I warn you, maybe you're about to find out so-and-so is not going to be able to help you out of this one. Huh? Maybe the doctor that you expected to bail you out or expected to help you Maybe he doesn't have your answer. Hmm? Maybe that cash cow that you expected to bail you out, maybe it's gone dry. Hmm? Maybe the connections that you uh, counted on to pull some strings, maybe they're not going to be able to do it. Listen, maybe you found out that the people you thought were going to help you will not. Maybe, uh, maybe you've just found out, hey, they're not the lifter of my head. God is. Huh? And if that's so, I think uh, one of the reasons God has allowed that to happen is because he wants you to look to him as the lifter of your head. Right? Sure, God uses people to help us out, but we must stop looking to people to do for us what only God can do for us. Huh? He will be the lifter of our head. He will be our deliverer. He is the one who will help us in our situation and turn our sorrow into joy. Notice David's personal pronouns here. He is a shield for me. He is my glory. He is the lifter of my head. You see that? Mm. This psalm is speaking about David's very real, very personal commitment to God. There's no nominal religion here in Psalm 3. Hello. David was in the trial of his life. And when you come to your most difficult moments, Christianity is either very real to you or it is not. Hello. God is either all of these things that David's talking about or he is not. Okay, And when we hit rock bottom, we find out whether what we say we believe is truly what we really believe. Huh? And for David, this was not a religious game. God was the only thing he had left, and he called out to him from his heart. And when you're in suffering, you don't play any religious games. If it is not real to you, you toss it aside during suffering. If it is real, then it is the most important thing that you have. See, sometimes God allows us, like David, to be stripped of virtually everything we have. And in those times, we find how real our faith is. Hmm? So is he your glory tonight? Is he the most significant thing in your life tonight? If you were to lose everything else, can you still glory in God? Huh? Is he the lifter up of your head? Has your hope been in someone or something else? Are you ma Hey, David made it personal. And it's one thing to believe that he can do it, God can do it, and that he'll do it for someone else, but it's another thing to believe that he'll do it for you. Hmm? It's one thing to believe that he will lift someone else's head it's another thing to trust him to be the lifter of your head. Humiliation and embarrassment always expresses itself in a physical posture. That, that, that is, we're guarded and we're cautious. David was probably having doubts about himself, about the validity of his calling, about his capacity to be a, a leader and a king, about his worth as a man. He was low. Absalom, his son's treachery, had inflicted a depth, a depth of humiliation that the human soul, hey folks, it just wasn't built to endure that. 
I don't care what you say. Listen, it was emotionally crippling and threatened to destroy David's credibility and his confidence as a man after God's own heart. Some of us know exactly how David feel, felt. I mean, in our case, it may have been a stinging defeat, an embarrassing failure, perhaps a public humiliation that we fear has forever destroyed our usefulness or our value to God or place in his kingdom. Listen, that's a devastating feeling. It's a low feeling. And, and truth is, the enemy will often exploit the opportunity by reminding us of virtually every sin we've ever committed. Come on now, I'm keeping it real. And that does nothing but reinforce the painful conviction that we are now beyond recovery. We're hopelessly helpless. And, it's, and that we're a stain, for example, on the public face of the church. Listen, it might even be the rebellion of a child, as in the case of David. For some, it's the demise of a business venture into which you had poured every ounce of your energy and income, and it goes belly up. Or it might be something less catastrophic, but no less painful, such as a failed attempt at public ministry or an embarrassing misstep that left you feeling exposed and unprotected. In David's case, despite this crushing blow at the hands of his son, his faith in God never wavered. Amen. Or at least not so as to throw him into utter despair because there was always the one and only who was able, he said, to restore his strength and give him reason to hold his head high. Oh, hallelujah. Now I want you to notice, it's important to remember that in spite of David's faith, Absalom, his son, died rebellious and estranged from his father. See, sometimes our circumstances don't always turn out the way we would like them to. Hello. But no matter what transpires of this Broadway, we can be sure God is a shield around us. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody needs to believe that right now. I said, God is a shield around us. He is our glory, and he is the lifter up of our head. What a picture of God's compassion. Huh? You ever picked up a newborn baby? I'm sure you have. Notice how carefully you, you lift and support that tiny head. Huh? We cup and we shield that fragile face. That's how David pictures God. Imagine on a battlefield, a soldier's wounded. He's delirious from thirst. His head, though, is lifted gently by a comrade who comes to tend his wounds and share a drink of cool water with him. David pictures God like that. Hallelujah. He'll come and he'll lift up our head so that we can see beyond the battle. Some of you need to see beyond the battle tonight. Beyond the pain, beyond the grief, get a, get a glimpse of his glory. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Boy, I got to quit. Sister Jones, come, would you... You know, how many's heard of Andrew Murray? Andrew Murray, he was a famous South African minister and writer. He lived primarily in the 1800s. When he was in a very difficult time in his life, he wrote in his journal uh, what I want to read you, and he titled it, He Brought Me Here. I quote, First, he brought me here, and it is by his will that I am in this straight place, in that fact will I rest. Secondly, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace to behave as his child. Then he will make the trial a blessing 
teaching me the lessons he intends me to learn and working in me the grace that he means to bestow. And last, in his good time, he will bring me out again how and when he knows. So let me say I am here, number one, by God's appointment, number two, in his keeping, number three, under his training, and finally, number four, for his time. Andrew Murray, in the midst of his trial, said, in his time, he'll bring me out. You know, that's just another way of saying he's the lifter up of my head. He's the lifter of my head. As we stand together, make it your personal commitment to say to God like David did, Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Verse 4 says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. He heard me out of his holy hill. God heard David. God heard Noah in the ark. God heard Jonah in the fish. God heard Joseph in the prison. God heard Daniel in the den of lions. God heard Jeremiah in the pit. God heard Samson in the temple of the enemy. And God heard Jesus on the cross. God will hear you tonight. Hallelujah. Why? Because he hears his children when they pray. It's one of the blessings we can count on. I said it's one of the blessings we can count on. Father, here tonight, thank you for these moments we've shared together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the time we've been able to spend in this psalm. I pray you would be the blessing unto your people here tonight. Be the glory and the lifter of their heads. In Jesus' name, amen. The last phrase of the psalm is thy blessing is upon thy people. Somebody raise your hands and say, we're blessed. We are blessed. Why? Because his blessings are upon his people. Stories told of an old Navajo Indian who struck it rich when oil was found on his property. He sold the oil and took the money, put it in the local bank. His banker became familiar with the habits of this old gentleman Every so often, this Native American would come and show up at the bank, and he'd look at the banker, and he'd say, grass all gone, sheep all sick, water holes all dry. Without a word, the banker would take the old Indian into the vault, show him several bags of silver dollars, and say, all this is yours. The old man would spend about an hour the banker said, stacking up the silver dollars and counting them. Then he'd return them to the bag, to their place. Come out of the vault and say, hmm, grass all green, sheep all well, and water holes are full. The point is, it's amazing the change that comes over us when we review our resources and count our blessings. Amen, Broadway. Why don't you raise your hands and say, God, one of those blessings is you're my shield and my glory, and you're the lifter up of my head. 
Brooklyn Tabernacle. You remember that song? Thou, O Lord, I love it, I love it. Many are they increased that trouble me. That's taken right from this psalm. Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be that say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But sing it. The verse. And then the chorus goes like this. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the lifter. Just take a moment. If you gotta go, God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. If you got a moment, why don't you come across the front and just 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 be reminded? He's my glory. Things may not be the best at the workplace, may not be the best at the home place. But here in the presence of the Lord, may you be reminded. Thou, O oh Lord, are a shield he's a shield for me. For me. My glory, my glory and, and the lifter, lifter of my head. For thou, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. Thank you, Jesus. My glory and the lifter Oh, I bless your name, Lord. trouble me